I am thrilled to have joining me today, Heather Douglas. Um, Heather is a philosopher of science. She is best known for her work of the role of, so of social and ethical values in science and science policy. I couldn't have found a better speaker to actually kick us off and talk about it. Uh, she also talks about the relationship between science and democracy, which we'll hear about today, and science communication. So we're going to cover a lot of these big themes here to kick us off. Uh, she's a professor professor at Michigan State University. Um, she's got a ton of affiliations with this amazing institute in Canada that I've been jokingly calling my sister society already. <laughs> It's the Institute for Science, Society, and Policy, if I remember correctly. Um, and she's got a many other affiliations as well as being the author of The Rightful Place of Science, Science Values and Democracy, among other books and publications. She is ve very well regarded in this topic. Um, Heather, good morning. Thank you so much for being here today. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. It's an honor to be here. Wonderful. Well, I will step off and let you take it over for the opening keynote and I'll be back on towards the end and we'll have a little Q&A uh, with you towards the end of today's talk. So thank you and take it from here. Excellent. Okay. How? Yeah, there they are. There are the slides. Okay. So thank you all for joining me today. Um, we're going to talk about ethics of science communication, particularly in a democratic context. So there are two starting points for me for thinking about this issue generally. The first is a belief that democracy is the best form of government we have available. As the quip goes, it's the worst form of government except for all the rest. So this means that we need to think about the fact that our democratic systems in every country in which there is a democracy, we have pluralist publics publics who disagree on what the best conception of a good life is. Um, there are many things that publics care about generally, but exactly what orders and what priorities is often an issue of great contestation and has been throughout the history of democracies. So it is not new to our current times. It is a pervasive feature of democratic societies. That means that we need to have power that is both contested and contestable. So when we elect someone, we need to be able to critique them and then recall them if we find that they are not doing what they're supposed to do. But it also has to have mechanisms of legitimating power um, because democratic societies are about collective governance. There has to be legitimated power. So it's really important that democracies have uh, situations of open debate, and that we have recall power for those who are elected to represent us. At the same time, another starting point for me is that science is the best source of empirical knowledge available. That doesn't mean it gives us fixed permanent truths. In fact, one of the reasons that I will argue shortly that science is the best source of knowledge available is because it doesn't provide permanent truths. There is endemic empirical uncertainty in all scientific claims. Going back to David Hume's problem of induction, science is inductive practice. Uh, claims of science always go beyond the evidence that is available. And so there is always uncertainty. And so the truths are not permanent and fixed. Science as such is a human practice and a social practice. It is done by people and is done by people collectively. And it is also importantly value-laden. So this has been central to my work to think about the role of values in science. And over the past 20 years, there's been a great deal of scholarship on this issue. These are just some of the books um, that have come out. There are at least in this literature, at least two crucial places for not just sort of knowledge related values, but social and ethical values within the practice of science. The first is that values need to direct the efforts of scientists by framing problems properly. So what are the right or appropriate range of hypotheses and evidence being considered? Are the things we really care about within the frame of the research being pursued? If not, can we bring it in in any sort of way? Um, and then the second area is that the values have to decide what counts as sufficient evidence. I mean, to inform that judgment that we have enough evidence when we're gathering evidence, when do we stop? When is it enough to support a claim? And that judgment involves how much uncertainty we're willing to accept, 
in particular contexts that might be whether or not we're more worried about avoiding false positives or false negatives and how those in errors might impact things that we care about. These are just two of the places that have been discussed by philosophers of science. There are additional places in the choice of methods that scientists use, in the modeling decisions that scientists deploy, which parameters get modeled in which kinds of ways, and of course, in the use decisions uh, for science. So how does this produce what I called claimed as reliable science if it's so value-laden? So the way in which philosophers of science, since the work of Helen Longino in 1990 at least, is that so thinking about scientific research as pursued within a community and those community practices as being essential to the structuring and production of reliable knowledge. That scientific research uh, communities are critical of each other, that they are debating with each other all the time. Um, over many different aspects of the practices of doing science, that the scientific community is in fact open to all commoners, that anyone who wants to be a scientist can come into the scientific community, that there aren't arbitrary exclusions based on one's background or identity in any form, and that there is no claims held above the critical fray permanently in science. We might hold some things as well, settled enough for now, um, but nothing is protected from criticism in a principled way. So this means that scientific claims are always revisable in practice. They're revisable because they're empirically based, which means new evidence or new methods of gathering evidence or better theories are always possible down the road and might replace what we think of as fairly reliable research. So for example, in my lifetime, when I was in grade school, I was taught there are no, um, po there's no possibility for inheriting acquired characteristics. And then 20 years later, epigenetics developed as a field in science, which is all about the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Um, this ongoing uncertainty, while it can be disquieting for members of the public, um, is in fact the source of the reliability because the ongoing uncertainty generates the openness for debate for critique, and that is what makes the science we have today the most reliable we have available to us at this time. So what does this mean for science communication, especially science communication in democratic contexts? So in thinking about science communication, one might notice that there are lots of different goals that might be involved with science communication. We could be trying to inform citizens of important scientific developments. We could also be trying to enable citizens to evaluate the decisions of their elected officials on science-related policies. So how are elected officials utilizing the science that's available to them? And do we think they're using them in a good way? That is often a critical decision in our choices of their evaluation of their judgments and whether or not we might wanna recall them from having representative power. We also want to encourage public support for science. Uh, science get, receives billions of dollars in public funds every year in this country alone. Is that a, a good investment? We want to actually help uh, the public understand what that investment uh, gets for them. And then we want to enable people to make scientifically informed decisions in their own lives. Oftentimes, the most important decisions uh, that we make involving science are less about decisions to recall politicians and more about what we should do. Should we get a vaccine? Should we wear a mask? Should we get an electric vehicle? Should we put photovoltaic panels on our roofs or in on our properties? Um, these are decisions that we make that should be scientifically informed. Then there's imparting wonder of the world. We get those wonderful photographs back from uh, t telescopes uh, put into orbit around the earth. That is all about wonder of the world and none of really sort of these decision makings in our daily lives. Um, and then there's fostering a better understanding of how science works in practice. Now you might notice this is a lot. Um, this is a very complex set of goals that we might have, and I'm not even sure I have all of them. In fact, I, I doubt I do. So how um, might we approach this? Well, one thing to think about is that all of these modes, all these goals for science, communication, and democracies depend upon some amount of trust. 
And so how should we engender trust in science communication? In order to think about this, I think it's important to realize um, that uh, trust is not the same as many as reliance. So reliance can be just mechanical. It's not that we're just asking people to rely upon science, but we often want people to trust science or to trust science communicators. So reliance could be without trust because I could, for example, rely upon a rickety bridge to cross a ravine without trusting that bridge in the slightest or spy agencies might rely upon uh, feeding information to a spy for an adversarial government and rely upon that spy to feed misinformation to that government without trusting them at all. So reliance can be this sort of utilization of a known mechanical practice um, without trust. Trust requires, in most people's views who look at these issues, a belief in goodwill towards the truster. So it's reliance plus a belief that the trustee has some of my interests at heart or has goodwill or concern for me. As Kieran O'Doherty has recently argued in a, a paper in the Journal of Responsible Innovation, trust is not necessarily the thing that we should all be focused on because fostering trust could just be manipulative. The key question is not whether or not someone has trust, it's also whether or not the thing that or person that they're trusting is trustworthy. So we don't want to just induce trust, but we want to be deserving of that trust. So in the next part of the talk, I'm going to try to unpack what makes science trustworthy uh, and what, you know, how should, what, what kind of account could we give of the trustworthiness of science, especially given the fact that I've already described how science doesn't produce fixed truths, it's endemically uncertain, and value-laden. Okay, this is also set against the backdrop that there are lots of good reasons to distrust science. Um, none of these are pervasive for all of science or all scientific institutions, but these are things that pervade some parts of every aspect of uh, every area of science. So there's the case of scientific fraud. There are lots of cases of this. Um, it's happily not a majority of science that's fraudulent, but in studies of this, uh, it looks like one to 2% of scientific research is does involve the fabrication or the falsification of the data at some basic level. This is disturbing um, and a problem. Then there are cases where scientists fail to engage with criticisms or new approaches that they are not as open and non-dogmatic as they should be. There are also cases where scientists hype their research or overpromise what can be done. This is pervasive in scientific grant proposals, in news releases from universities uh, on grant proposals that have been funded. There's often this, if only if this research works, and there are a bunch of other caveats, then we will solve this problem. And very often the research does not deliver the full promise. We have problems around this, around precision medicine. We have problems around this, around the Human Genome Project, that these are going to solve all kinds of medical problems. And it doesn't look like, like it's going to pan out that way. It's not that there were not values, valuable results from those pro uh, projects. It's just that the... Um, Initial promising was far outstripped from what was actually produced. And then there are problems of commercialized science, the bending of science towards particular results, either by cherry picking studies, by selecting methodologies to produce desired results. There are lots of cases of this in both medical and agricultural research, um, unfortunately. And then there's the history of minority abuse uh, by scientists, either uh, people of color, indigenous populations. There are so many cases in the history of science where these populations have been egregiously abused by scientists in the pursuit of science. So there are lots of reasons for distrust of science. Again, this isn't a comprehensive list. So what makes science trustworthy now? I'm going to argue that there are three essential bases for trust in science that I think make science trustworthy. One is a presence of expertise. Another is that expert or experts engaging in a critical and diverse scientific community. And the third 
is the presence of shared values. So let me talk about each of these in turn. How might a non-expert assess for the presence of expertise? This involves some thinking about what expertise is. In my view, expertise is a fluid judgment in the face of complexity within a particular domain. Um, this is developed within an expert community. Um, crucially, one is usually trained within an expert community. Very often advanced degrees are involved. Um, those aren't necessary, but that is a usual path. Um, and experts display an ability to ask crucial questions about any particular evidence or about a particular issue. And they tend to know what has worked, what hasn't worked, where there might be open pathways still for additional pursuit, and where things look fairly closed off. One of the things I think is important to recognize is that we are each experts in some domains and non-experts in many, many other domains. So uh, uh, an uh, imbalance in the knowledge between experts and non-experts is a pervasive part of our lives in the 21st century. So how might we uh, assess expertise? Well, some experts are easy to assess because their success as an expert is very clear. So for example, experts who win games, um, chess masters. We know who a chess master is because when they're in chess tournaments against other chess masters, they're the ones who win. So they don't have to explain how they win the games. They don't have to explain their strategies, similar for Go players or professional athletes. They don't have to know how they are successful. The practice that they operate in is clear and constrained. Success is a clear metric, and we can all see it happen when it happens. In our daily lives, there are some experts that are kind of like this with some caveats. Uh, experts that we interact with, like car mechanics, our doctors, our dentists, people who help us solve problems. They have to, if they're going to be reliable experts, at least solve a lot of our problems a lot of the time. Sometimes they might have some explanations of why their solutions might not work out that well. But um, most of the time they tend to work and occasionally they can tell us why something hasn't worked and explain why. The experts that we really have the most contestation about involve cases where success is really murky in practice. And this is because these are experts dealing with very large complex systems that either have a lot of confounders built into those systems. And so whether or not success is due to the intervention or due to some other factor is always contestable, or the time frames with which we are dealing, often like climate modelers are dealing with decades, and we really have a hard time waiting to see whether or not, in fact, they're successful. So how should we assess the presence of expertise? For clear success cases, is a success? When compared with other experts, great, we're done. When you don't have um, really clear cases of success, either confounded or because of timeframes or other reasons, what we want of our experts is to give key pieces of evidence and reasoning not all their evidence and reasoning, because we can't handle that as non-experts, provide what has been ruled out and why, explain their judgments, display the fluency. Very often when we talk to an expert who has this kind of expertise, I tend to realize how little I actually know about the area. It's not that their explanations impart their expertise to me. It is that I understand how little I know and how out of my depth I actually am in that particular terrain. Okay, what we also want of these experts is to, that they are engaged in critical and diverse communities. Um, this means there need to be clear locations for debate, criticism, and discussion, just conferences, journals, and online forum. We want to see that our experts are actually engaging with these kinds of practices. This is crucial. Um, and we want the culture of this critical and diverse community to take seriously debate. There should be an expectation of both raising and responding to criticism within that forum or within those forums. And we also have to make sure it's open to all who want to join the community so that 
we have diverse perspectives represented within the epistemic community. This is key for generating criticism and for generating those alternative approaches that ultimately make the knowledge more reliable. So we wanna make sure that we have experts who can explain their ideas or have clear metrics of success. In both cases, they must be engaged in some kind of expert community. And then finally, we want our experts to have some shared values. This is because value judgments, as I said above, are crucial to scientific practice. And so having some of the judgments, especially the crucial judgments that shape scientific research or assess the sufficiency of evidence, need to be shared between those who are gonna trust that expert and the expert themselves. So are problems framed to include what I care about? Are methods sufficiently capable of capturing what I care about? And is the evidence strong enough given my concerns over risks of error? Ultimately, I have argued we should trust the expert who makes the judgments as we would if we had their expertise. So that having the expertise is crucial, but so are sharing some of the key value judgments. This is not to say that the values can play any role whatsoever. So there are limits on how values can function in science. They should not supplant evidence. You shouldn't, you know, <coughs> use the values in place of evidence. <coughs> Excuse me. Nor should the values predetermine or bend research. So you shouldn't pick, have experts picking methodological choices that guarantee particular results. Nor should they be reasons to ignore criticism. A key value that all experts should share is that inquiry itself must also be valued. And that means values have to be constrained in how they impact the practice of inquiry. And these limits should keep values from biasing science. So this means in practice, it's not that we're trusting experts who say what we want to hear. It's that we're trusting experts who would make judgments as I would if I had their expertise. The expertise constrains the uh, legitimate roles and uh, ranges that values can actually impart. <coughs> and this might make you wonder, what about scientific consensus? I thought this was a really important aspect of science communication, communicating the consensus on science. What I want to emphasize here is that consensus is no shortcut. In order to trust a, a consensus, a scientific consensus, it has to be a trustworthy consensus. Every theorist who actually thinks about this actually delves into that to some extent. This means that a consensus has to be properly formed. It can't be just people uh, sort of um, agreeing to uh, settle on something before the debate is over. So there needs to be a good debate. The consensus has to emerge out of that good debate. It has to be among experts who are already trustworthy, among a diverse community of experts. So we're all gonna have to assess these aspects of community functioning and value judgments and trustworthy expertise, even if we're saying relying upon a consensus. Now the particularly valuable thing about a consensus is that if it is this kind of consensus, a trustworthy consensus, your values are already, should be already held by a member of the community. And if they agree with the consensus, your value judgments have already informed the debate in ways that you would want if you had their expertise. So the consensus would be trustworthy for a broad array of the public. But we don't have to wait for consensus. In cases of disagreement, when experts disagree, we don't want experts to prematurely generate the consensus. We want to trust experts who are properly participating in the debate, not being what I've called inquirer facades, pretending, but not actually responding to criticism. And then we want to trust experts that share your values for reasons I've already said. Okay, so in sum, I think there are three bases for trustworthy science, tr presence of expertise, engagement in a well-functioning scientific community, and shared values. What does this mean for science communication? the theme of today's event. So this gives us, I think, some guidelines on what to communicate in practice. Um, if we're doing science communication, whether as a scientist or a science journalist or professional science communicator for some other form, like a science museum, we want to communicate expertise and some sense of the fluidity and complexity of judgment. 
if there's active debate and the functioning of the community, we want to communicate that active debate, whether historically, maybe it's a consensus that's already reached a conclusion. How did that happen? What were the key debates? We should display that so people know it's a trustworthy consensus and communicate values of judgments that informed the science going into these things. So in practice, I think uh, we want to provide key evidence and reasons because this is part of displaying expertise. I think doing so in a narrative form is crucial for audiences who are non-expert, um, probably avoiding probabilistic exp expressions <coughs> that often pretend to more precision than exists is less helpful. Very often um, non-expert audiences have a hard time interpreting those. We want to uh, communicate what has been considered and set aside because this provides a window on the expert community debate. How did things get um, set outside the bounds of plausibility and what is still within the bounds? What is still a disagreement? How might we explain those things? Note again that consensus is not required. It can be helpful if it's properly formed and we can show that, that can be something around which very diverse publics could agree, but we need to provide more than just the fact of consensus. And then we want to share the values that shaped the key judgments going into the scientific practice, how the problems were framed, how evidence was assessed, what were the key modeling decisions, were there key methodological restrictions that had to be dealt with in some way, these are all really important to communicate at some level. Some of my favorite examples of this um, are uh, for science journalists. I think Undark does a spectacular job. And he's a recent uh, uh, feature essay on um, prediction, uh, precision medicine and genetic testing and the limits and the possibilities there and how uh, people are worried about it and how it might go about it. And they're great at displaying the debate that's going on across disciplines focused on this particular issue in both academic, commercial, uh, commercial science and regulatory efforts around it. And so they show actually what is actually going on in a field. This I think helps make uh, the reporting trustworthy and helps people figure out, well, which experts should I be trusting in this debate? And then for a particular science communicator, I happen to be a big fan of your local epidemiologist, both for her very clear uh, display of evidence. This is, for example, the um, state of affairs for our particular viruses right now going on in this country um, and her annotations on that. It's a very clear showing that we are actually above epidemic levels for um, some of our viral transmissions across the country. Unfortunately, um, compared to past years, we are perhaps not as bad as, uh, you know, the yellow line, but um, things are rising. And her discussions of both the limitations of the, of the evidence, what the policy choices might be, how there are value trade-offs in those policy choices, like when to get which vaccine. She's really good at explaining her own judgments and why, how she makes the judgments and how other people might make different judgments and still be within the re reasonable base of understanding the science. Okay, so what does this mean for the ethics of science communication? We need to communicate those aspects of science that show trustworthiness, um, the presence of expertise, the functioning of expert community and important values. We want to communicate also those aspects that are not trustworthy. We should air the failures of science so that we can see that science is catching the cases where expert is failing, where fraud is occurring, where, uh, you know, maybe there was overpromising and hype, where there have been abuses, and holding to account those scientists who have failed the public in various ways. Corrections to failures can also build trust in the institutions of science. So the public should trust only those aspects of science that are in fact trustworthy. And we want to build our communicative practices to help display what is in fact trustworthy and what is not in science. So thinking about our goals for science communication, if we think about these complex goals, um, informing citizens of important scientific developments, uh, 
what I'm suggesting for the ethics of science communication would meet these things. Enabling citizens to evaluate the decisions of their elected officials, encouraging public support for science, helping people make decisions, imparting the wonder of the world, and fostering a better understanding of science. I think all of these goals can be met within this framework. So in conclusion, we want to communicate guided on basis for trust and trustworthiness and expertise. We want expert explanations and judgments. Um, hold on a sec. I have to close the door. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I forgot I need to close the door. Um, debate in scientific community past and present. And we want to have value central to key judgments recognizing that all of this is taking place within a context of a democratic society where pluralist publics exist. And we need those pluralist publics to be reflected in our diverse scientific communities because shared values are essential to trust. We also wanna communicate those values so that we make sure we uh, generate uh, communication that supports the proper basis of trust. This does mean in practice that in cases where there's still expert disagreement, particular pieces of scientific research, particular scientific experts may not be universally trustworthy. That in cases where we have ongoing debate, science is not gonna be univocal. And we need to be okay with this. This doesn't mean just you know believing whoever says what you wanna hear, doing this properly, communicating properly and being a member of a non-expert public is going to be more demanding than that. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can always say in a lot of cases, just follow the science when the science in fact has debate within it. Um, further, and this is a talk for another day, thinking about um, how we might actually create spaces for full and thick interaction between publics and experts could help with these things to help align the value judgments, display the debates, and display expert judgment in practice more fully. Thank you so much, and I look forward to discussing with you all these issues. Let me take myself off mute. <laughs> Wonderful talk, Heather. Thank you so much. Uh, wow, I was captivated. I learned a ton. I was taking notes. Thank goodness I have a copy of your slides. <laughs> really great. I'm going to obviously bring in some audience questions. Um, but while I'm waiting for audience questions to come in, I obviously have a ton of my own. Um, we've got about 15 minutes or so here to, to interrogate you with some great questions. But I want to start a little bit with big picture, because you talked a lot about having these values within the scientific community, right? And how do we have these values that guide the work? How do we decide this, right? There is, there's just this inherent tension, which you articulated, which is we want this diversity of thought in the community. Also, we probably need to reach some sort of general consensus about what these values are, right? So, so how do we decide this? Could you, I know this is probably a whole separate talk, um, <laughs> but I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about some of your thinking on that. Yeah, so I actually, um, when we have deep uh, pluralist publics where there's disagreement about what the values should be, where what sort of the most preeminent important things are in society and every European, North American, South American, Asian democracy has pluralist publics that disagree, right? There's, there's no sort of universal agreement when social scientists study these things. Uh, in fact, there's divergence. I don't think we need to strive for consensus soon. Consensus on values can take a long time. So, um, you know, happily we have, I think, reached consensus that um, racism is bad and um, sexism is bad, <laughs> hooray. <laughs> there are cases where we have consensus, um, but pushing for value consensus is not something that I think uh, the scientific community could be expected to do. So in the meantime, it needs to be recruiting people who represent a diverse range of experiences in our societies. We need to have scientists from urban contexts and rural contexts. We need to have scientists from conservative households and liberal households. We need to have scientists from religious backgrounds and non-religious backgrounds brought in to the practice of doing science. And then when 
uh, you know, the scientists develop their expertise and engages with the scientific community. Um, they can bring their perspective to the debate. It's not determinative. Um, none of these experiences that we've had, you know, determine what we're going to say as experts. Um, that would not be doing inquiry properly. Inquiry has to be open-ended. But it will shape how we frame problems, how we decide to pursue things, what we consider enough evidence. And then if we have this kind of diversity, it can be a boon to science communication. So I think it's Catherine Cahoe, who is an evangelical climate modeler, and she has been transformative for explaining climate scientists to evangelical churches because she can speak to them. She knows how to do so and has the background and has the shared values. So I think it's really important to foster the diversity and really sort of support those who might come into the scientific community from backgrounds that have been underrepresented and to bring those voices into science to make science more trustworthy. Agree. Yeah, I agree. It makes me think too about um, the idea of, of who is a trustworthy messenger and how do you balance that trustworthy messenger with the required and necessary expertise on a topic. Sometimes those can actually not be the same thing at all. Um, and that to me is a, is a emerging and growing challenge I think we see in society. You are absolutely correct. Um, just because someone has the right background doesn't mean they have the requisite expertise. And there are a whole mess of faux experts, people who pretend to have expertise, pretend to be engaged in scientific debate, but are in fact what I call the inquirer facades, and they just don't respond to criticism. Like it's, it's like a placard mm -hmm. <laughs> of an expert. <laughs> and they claim, they make the same claim, and then someone critiques it, and then they make the same claim again. <laughs> you might have encountered this. Um, that is not functioning properly in an expert community. There has to be an uptake and response to criticism. So, I could ask you a thousand more questions, but I know our audience has some. So I want to work in some from our audience. Um, Cameron K. Garrett um, uh, and I may that may be first and last name doesn't matter. <laughs> Had a fascinating question about um, thinking about experts and potentially preventing their own personal values to interfere or contaminate research um, or coloring the outcomes. Right, and so there is both we all have humans, so we all have values, and, and how do we distinguish between our personal values influencing our research um, and also value shaping research? So it very might well be personal values properly shaping research. If you think about you know researchers who pursue um, studies of marine mammals, very often it's because they love marine mammals, <laughs> right? Um, you study the things you care about, that's okay. It's really important to follow your passion if you're a scientist or it's not gonna go well, right? Pursuing science for things you don't care about. Um, what I have argued in recent papers is that just because it's your values and things that you care about doesn't mean it's biasing. I think it's really important to distinguish between value ladenness and biasing. If we take biasing to be systematic deviation from the truth, that's when values keep you from seeing evidence because you don't like it. It's leading away from what you want to conclude or um, helping uh, shaping methodologies so that you get an outcome that you want. And there we're systematically pushing the research away from the truth. But if there are things that you care about and you also care about inquiry, you also care about getting more accurate assessments of the world, the values can importantly shape what kinds of questions you ask, how you frame your methods, when you think evidence is sufficient without steering away from the truth. So even though it's your personal values, I don't think that's a problem as long as it's not biasing. And further, talking about those choices is the, this is why this because i care about this i um developed for example a new way of measuring um gwen ottinger uh, my colleague in um, sds has done work on this helping develop new ways for example of um, air monitoring because she was concerned about care uh capturing the impact of spiked uh pollution emissions on communities of color 
And the existing air monitoring systems didn't do that. They captured averages. They didn't care about particular flare events. But there might well be very strong health concerns for the flare events alone, even if the average is fine. So she developed new methods to try to capture that, to try to help study it, and maybe potentially create new regulations around it. That was, you know, a personal value. Here's something I care about. It's not that you produce biased results as a result. You might actually produce better results as a result. Great. I, I'm hearing, you know, themes of clarity, transparency, humility, right? Yes, <laughs> you know, yes. Those are the virtues. <laughs> that, like, I think we all try to hopefully embrace to some degree, but are actually quite hard at times, mm -hmm. particularly those who hold a microphone at, or, you know, are, are in this public perspective public sphere and have those attentions and eyeballs. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let me bring in an audience question, unless you wanted to comment on that comment I had, but. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to try to not be defensive. Yeah. Um, I also think like, hmm, I prefer openness to transparency because like there's no way an expert can display everything, mm -hmm. right? If they did, it won't be communicative because it's too complicated. <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. So there's always a what Ahmad Elbar is called curation of information mm -hmm. for good communication. And that means not everything is visible. And that's OK, as long as you're open about the really important things. Anyway. Of information <laughs> and being open. Um, let me bring in a question from um, a friend of the Institute's Tom, who wanted to, you to comment a little bit more on the climate change conversation. You brought up Catherine Hayhoe, yeah. right? And then the, the debate, right? There is still a public, there's a gap between the scientific consensus about human induced climate change and uh, public acceptance of this. Um, you know, he asked, is there a mismatch in values on this or what's your, what's your thinking on the why behind some of this? Yeah. I mean, honestly, as someone who works on energy decarbonization as a side hobby, because I'm really passionate about it. Um, I think, uh, the debate about climate change science is less important than a debate about climate, uh, mitigation policy, especially in the U S. Um, and there, I think the discussion needs to be about not just because there is this pervasive free rider problem. Like even if we decarbonize our communities or households, will everyone else? Otherwise, the world goes up in flames. Right? Everyone needs to do this. Um, and so then people are worried about that. They're worried about, you know, being first, going early, um, making sure everyone else is on board. And I think there the debate ends up should should actually be focused on um, the benefits to each of us. So, uh, you know, irrespective of climate mitigation, electric vehicles are amazing. They're so quiet and they're so much less expensive to run and to charge and not having to go to the gas station is so nice um, if you have a garage. And then the worry is about the justice of the infrastructure. The how do we get the charging infrastructure people who don't have garages? Um, or uh, the way in which reducing our fossil fuel electricity production really improves all kinds of health outcomes and environmental justice issues. It's all these additional benefits. that, And then there's the cost, the fact that it's actually less expensive to put up renewables than a new fossil fuel plant. Okay, so there are all these things that we can emphasize that align with a wide range of values, irrespective of worrying about whether or not we are, would be alone in sort of bearing the climate burden. It turns out bearing the climate burden is making our lives better. Um, Decarbonization would make our lives better. And then thinking about the rest of the world, the key issue there seems to be one of climate justice and how to help uh, the global South actually develop the proper energy infrastructure without going through a fossil fuel phase and um, helping with adaptation for the most vulnerable communities, both in uh, our own country and abroad, right? And those are justice issues and they should appeal to justice values. Now notice that none of this really hinges upon whether or not the climate models or the like perfect forecasts of the planet which I think is where the debate needs to be. Right. It's complicated. Yeah. 
<laughs> yep, right. It's often sometimes an economic argument or some one of these other arguments, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think it's been, you know, well, I actually think that first panel is going to talk a little bit about this too. So I'm going to hold my thought knowing what they've talked about. But let me move you into just another question or two before we can wrap up here. I, I really like this question as well, which is um, how do we ethically communicate um, that consensus is under development when there could be motivation to fill the vacuum, right? with potential misinformation or some other, I would say self-interest or whatever. Um, you know, they brought up the example of the early days of COVID, right? We were, there was a lot of scrambling of what do we do and what do we know? And when there's a void, particularly in a public health emergency, right? Like there is a desire that we need to make decisions and people need to fill that vacuum. And that can be a challenge. So how do, how should communities that are trying to put out, this is what we know at the time, scientifically, this is what we think, um, when the consensus is still under development. So I think that's actually the normal state of science communication, um, <laughs> that the science is under development. Um, and I think it's really important that if you're an individual science communicator that you want to impart a particular message, that you acknowledge both the evidential basis and its limitations. So, um, because if the science is still developing, you might have to change your mind. And if you come out too strongly saying, you know what's going on, and this is the thing to do, and then you change your mind, you will have lost trust. And you will look less trustworthy, and properly so, because you wouldn't have had the right sort of um, full display of your actual expert judgment. Whereas if you then you say, instead you say, okay, look, it's really clear we have a new virus. It looks like it might be, I mean, I was looking, I remember in 2020, February, 2020, I was looking at the death rates and thinking, wow, this is like 10 times more deadly than the flu. This is going to be serious. This is going to be really serious. But I also was listening to experts who told me not to bother wearing a mask. And I got COVID in March, 2020 for my students. So I was a bit miffed when I found out, you know, later that, um, in fact, what ex the experts were saying was don't wear masks because we need them for the healthcare providers. <laughs> not that they're not effective. Not that it might not have been a valuable thing to do. Not that, like, you know, making a homemade mask might have actually been effective. Like double layered cotton muslin with like, you know, little elastic things. That might have been helpful. I might not have gotten COVID in March of 2020 and brought it home to my family. That was not a good thing to do. They should have, the experts at the time should have been clearer about the basis. Like, please don't buy these particular masks because we need them for the medical community. Because if the medical system collapse, we are all sunk in this thing that's coming. That doesn't mean that we we don't know whether or not masks are effective or um, there's some indication that masks might be effective, but the N95 masks have to be reserved for those who are dealing with our most sick in these institutionalized settings. That would have been a much more honest statement mm -hmm. and one that would, I think, served the communication around COVID better. Great. I'm going to squeeze in one more question. We have many more for our audience. We're not going to get to with you, but hopefully we can carry them over throughout today's conversation. But let me take one more audience question for you, Heather, um, which was um, Alan was curious about, you know, you actually talked about early about the public investment, right? It's a public resource that often supports a lot of our scientific research, right? It, it has a pretty big price tag on it, right? And, and science is expensive. Um, and he was curious about justifying and allocating um, public resources when it's science for science or science to solve a societal problem, right? And I would say there are relations, but distinctions between the two and they're both of value. But how do you, how would you articulate this question or, or respond to this question? Okay, so I have a whole nother talk on this. The elevator version is right now, I don't think we're doing a good job of being honest about, um, about why we fund science. So we tend to end up demanding hype for scientists who want to pursue science to understand things and maybe down the road be some benefit. 
And we're making them say things like, and this will, you know, lead to a cure for this major disease, even if, you know, frankly, they don't really think that it's like all that likely. And um, no one who knows the field would think that. That's not healthy. Um, we should have clearer funding for science for science sake. I actually think it should be lottery funding where you eliminate like the really implausible stuff and then just throw the rest in because we don't know what the most important science is going to be. That's the whole point of doing it is we don't know how it's going to turn out. And then have different funding structures where you're really trying to solve societal problems. And you do that in concert with and engagement with those folks you're really trying to help. And then they're part of the evaluation structure. Mm -hmm. So that's just, there's more complexity going on uh, in the, the longer version, but that's at least a short answer. Well, wonderful, thank you. We have, uh, I have her book sitting right here. We'll have links to resources for those of you who, if we don't cover the topic or you wanna dig deeper, we'll definitely be sharing those out and put them on the website after um, our symposium is over. Heather, thank you so much for being here today and opening up our talk with a really thought provoking um, conversation. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Uh, Alrighty, everyone, we will be back in about seven minutes. So top of the hour, depending on where you're tuning in from, it is 10 a.m. Mountain Time. So give us about seven minutes. We're just going to go quiet, stretch your legs, grab a refreshing beverage um, and join us here in six or seven minutes. We'll be right back. Thank you. <laughs>